Morning. Oh dear. Okay. Got to get that down. All right. Good morning. It's my honor to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Kurt Peeler. Kurt is a professor of history at Florida State, where he also serves as the director of the Institute of World War II and the Human Experience. Now, if I were to tell you everything that I would like to share with you about Kurt's extensive uh, teaching and writing on World War II, it would take up the rest of our time together this morning. So I just want to say one thing in particular, uh, and that is that Kurt's most recent book is A Religious History of the American GI in World War II, um, which, uh, which was published by the University of Nebraska Press last year. When I read this book, I was so moved by it that I published a review of it for the Christian century in April. Uh, we could not have a better speaker than Kurt on this Sunday when Bradley Hills is celebrating Veterans Day. So without further ado, I will turn the program over to you, Kurt. Oh, well, thank you very much. And it's a real, it's thank, I really appreciate your making this talk this uh, possible. I'm sorry I can't do it in, in person. I, I, when I was a grad student, I actually spent two years in Bethesda. I rented a room in a house for, right off of River Road, which is apparently not too far from the church. So I'm sorry I can't be there in person. But, uh, but as I said, I really appreciate this invitation to be with you this morning. Um, it also, you're a great group to also acknowledge uh, the support and uh, of the Presbyterian Historical uh, Society, which is based in Philly. If you've never, when you're in Philly, I encourage you to visit. It's not too far from um, Independence Hall. Um, and they gave me some grant money to actually use their collection. And, and it's a really wonderful uh, collection, not only on, on World War II and the chaplaincy, but just in general Presbyterian history, but also the general history of the United States. So um, I'm going to make my talk a little bit Presbyterian centric, uh, and I was sort of going through my index, and I, you know, one of the things I, I tried to index pretty consciously was chaplain slash Presbyterian, chaplain slash Roman Catholic, and and sort of ca ca uh, Pres Presbyterian chaplains figure pretty much through the book, but my book is more than a history of the chaplaincy. So I I came I come up with the project sort of addressing two sort of I think. And, and really connect two points. One, why, why religion in World War II? And one of the things World War II is it's dividing line in terms of the federal government's support of religion, religion for the American uh, soldiers and sailor, and in this case also aviator. Um, for the most part, until World War II, we did not devote many resources to the chaplaincy. I mean, much is made of, of religion in the Civil War. And I sometimes think we overestimate uh, how devout sort of the Civil War soldier is. This is the a lot more devout, but this is the war that gave us the term hookers. So one has to question the, the sort of you know religiosity of all Civil War soldiers. And and in fact, half of all Confederate Union units in 1861 went into battle without chaplains. And this is when the Confederacy is just starting out. And in terms of the Union Army the chaplaincy is pretty disorganized and pretty much a mess. Um, it, 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 you get become a chaplain in the Civil War because your colonel uh, appoints you. But in World War II, there are unprecedented resources devoted to promoting the religious life of the GI, particularly in the army. So you have a huge expansion of the chaplaincy. The desire is to make it representative of, of the different faiths in America. And ideally, they don't meet the goal of providing one chaplain for every 1,200 GIs. Uh, besides vastly expanding the chaplaincy, you have a systematic, systematic effort, even before we enter the war, to build chapels on army bases. And the government, at government expense, prints Hebrew scriptures, a Protestant uh, Bible, and also a, a Roman Catholic Bible, uh, and distributes this to, to GI, GIs in the army. Um, and so... Um, you know why, and a lot of it, I think, has to do with Franklin Roosevelt and his efforts to promote. He saw religion as central to a liberal democratic society. Um, and I do liberal in the broad sense of the term, not in a narrow political. Um, and he also really embraces religious pluralism. Um, 
And I also would say when we, we enact our first peacetime draft, so we're very concerned with GIs, these new draftees, uh, falling prey to gin joints and gambling dens and brothels. And so between chaplains and also the, the newly founded USO, which is a faith, was founded as a faith-based organization and is still run. The, the organizations that run the USO are six of the seven are still faith-based. Um, uh, and include the YMCA, the YWCA, uh, the Salvation Army, um, and the Jewish Welfare Board. Um, so this is this is partly the why. But I also come at the project from someone who interviewed back in the um, mid '90s of over 200 World War II veterans, and I was pretty good about asking about a range of subjects because I had no book in mind. And so one of the questions I asked about was religion, and I found sort of two things. One, how sectarian American society was in the 1930s and 40s. I was sort of realized this from, from you know, even stories my, 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 my late stepfather used to tell about growing up Catholic in New Jersey in the 20s and 30s. And he remembers very early the Ku Klux Klan burning crosses outside his home to try to drive them out as the first Catholic family in the neighborhood. Um, but I was also was surprised at how accommodating the military was to different religious faiths. And, and so I came, I, I came to this probably was sort of a twofold. One, I came in it through Franklin Roosevelt and the American, I was doing an ill-fated project on the American response uh, to Nazi Germany. Um, and I came to religion and FDR and I also increasingly saw that the, the accommodation that the military did to different religious faiths has a lot to do with Roosevelt's embrace of religious pluralism. Um, but I also try to address the question, what motivates GIs to fight? This is a big question that, that scholars write. And I think it's uh, probably the, many of you might have even have read Stephen Ambrose's Band of Brothers or, or know of Steve Ambrose, seen the HBO di, uh, uh, film series on the Band of Brothers. And we, we largely associate comradeship as the glue that kept GIs together. And as I started digging into this topic, I realized sort of two things. One, if you read the, the surveys that were conducted by the, by the Ar army sociologists and social scientists, prayer was the number thing, one thing they said sustained them in, in combat, followed them by comradeship. Patriotism was way down there. In fact, they often wrote derisive comments about flag wavers for those on the front line. Um, and then I also started looking at these chaplains and why they enlisted and their sermons and how they structured services and their letters of condolences. And I realized these were the, these were the political commissars of, of the American army and Navy. They, not in a narrow sense, but they really, uh, chaplains along with women are the true volunteers. They, uh, clergy can't be drafted in, in World War II. And so if you're a chaplain in the service really often goes to great lengths to volunteer. Um, particularly, you know, Roman Catholic priests, some Roman Catholic priests were really upset their bishop would not let them serve. They, along with women, could not be drafted. They're the true volunteers of the war. And many men are very much committed to the cause we're fighting, not just to protect American national security, but the causes of the four freedoms and the Atlantic Charter. And you could see this translated in how they conduct their services and, and what kind of sermons and messages uh, they're delivering. So I want to... Um, to, to, to provide for the religious life of the American GI. And some of this, I had to cut my manuscript down from 170,000 words to 130. Thank goodness they had me do it because it's a big enough book as it is. But stuff got ended up on the, on, the, on the cutting room floor. And one of the things that ended up on the cutting room floor is the tremendous support of a number of churches um, and also the Jewish Welfare Board and, and, and other organizations. So for example, the, the reform rabbis essentially drafted reform rabbis of a certain age. I mean, they couldn't quite compel them to serve, but they made it very difficult if they did not serve. Um, and the Presbyterian uh, Church, we, um, led by we, uh, and, the, and, the, and the point of contact with William Pugh, and I've read a lot of his correspondence that's preserved in the Presbyterian Historical um, society collection. He is very good about trying to recruit chaplains, including African-American chaplains. So one of the earliest chaplains they propose is in fact, um, is, is, a, is an African-American African chaplain. And one of, you one of the things you see with a lot of Protestant denominations, they're very interested in, in making sure African-American chaplains serve in the army. And the army is very good about recruiting black chaplains. Um, 
The army, uh, and as I said, if this was a Roman Catholic church, I'd now be talking a lot about William Arnold, the chief of chaplain, Monsignor Arnold, who's the chief of chaplains for the army. And uh, chief, one thing I will say about Arnold, is he was Vatican II before there was Vatican II. He really, he had his weaknesses uh, and he was a bit misogynist, uh, but he, in terms of embracing religious pluralism, he, he just, given the strictures he had to operate, this is a pre-Vatican II Catholic church, at times, he was just remarkable. It is a Presbyterian minister who actually is the chief of chaplains for the Navy, um, Robert Workman. And, and I have to say, I had to struggle with trying to reconstruct the Navy's religious life, even more so than the Army, because, for example, the Army did a good job of preserving its records in the National Archives. Um, and in fact, we had a wonderful visit uh, when I was doing research back. We were staying in Bethesda again. And, and going to the National Archives, and we were visiting friends in the Bethesda, we were living in Bethesda. The Navy didn't keep very good records. Um, they were very scattered. And well, William, William Arnold's personal papers were even preserved, and they're in the George Marshall papers. Workman records, Robert Workman's records were not, rec personal records and correspondence were not preserved. And that's very unfortunate. I, I, there, he, he had an interesting background. He's a former Marine. He actually was a Sergeant Major at one point in the Marines. He had been a personal messenger to Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, he becomes a Presbyterian chaplain. I've heard some who are critical of him. I ended up um, sort of not putting it in the book, but one, one chaplain just was irate about him and just couldn't stand him. But, but others were very favorable to Workman. Um, two things do, do strike him, very much like Arnold. Um, he is, he, is, he is very much embracing religious pluralism. And uh, Rabbi Joshua Goldberg, who was the first rabbi appointed to the Navy, for the first time, the Navy actually appoints Jewish chaplains. Um, up until that point, there, there had been no Jewish chaplains. Uh, and one thing Goldberg says is, at one point, he and a Roman Catholic priest uh, uh, and workmen, it's basically a world tour visiting GIs around the globe. And they often led services together and often addressed GIs GIs together, and he thinks um, um, that that workman really is very good about addressing, um, you know, address, you know, promoting religious pluralism. The other thing about workman is, uh, and what you can see, what churches are trying to do, and, and synagogues are trying to do with the government is often trying to preserve, um, uh, you know, freedom of the pulpit and freedom of, of uh, you know, the dictates of conscience. So, one of the sticking points. There are two sticking points that really earn the ire of chapel, chaplains. Not so, not so much, I didn't find it in Pew's correspondence, but I did find it in Roman Catholic leaders' correspondence and chaplains is the distribution of condoms. They, they really, you know, chaplains were supposed to give a morality lecture every month, if they were in the army every month, but the army was very skeptical about moral, moral suasion. So they're also making GIs take condoms. And this just really made particularly Catholic leaders, but not, not Catholic leaders alone, irate. The other thing that, that Pew does though, right, there's more correspondence is alcohol. Because in the case of the Navy, uh, chaplains are required, often are, they're naval officers and they're in the chain of command and they are required, uh, sometimes they're in, put in charge of mess. And so I have to collect the money for the officer's mess, including purchasing alcohol. Sometimes they're designated the recreational officer. And in the Navy, a chaplain can do a bunch of different duties. They could, they could run the library, they could give tests, uh, and they could be required to buy beer for the men when they're on shore leave. And for a lot of Presbyterian ministers, they're really upset with this. And they write, they write to Pew saying, we don't want to do this. And Pew really does, you know, it, you know he writes, for example, um, a fellow Presbyterian minister uh, workman about this issue. And, and he said, most commanders are very good about, you know, exempting you from this. And I would also say, I was sometimes struck by the flexibility of, of, of ministers. So there was one Methodist minister, and there's a really strong, dry tradition of Methodism. And he has no problem buying beer. He, 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 he just sees this as part of my duty. Uh, but, but some, some did. Um, so, um, on the question of morality, um, I think this is something that unites Protestant Christ, uh, Protestants, Catholics, and Jewish ch uh, chaplains, and and, it, and and also really uh, defending uh, existing gender norms. Uh, of uh, so, uh, one of the one of the figures that comes up at Edward Edward Ellison, Reverend Ellison. I would have loved to put more in the book because his papers were utterly fascinating. I'll have more to say about Ellison, but I first you'll first encounter Ellison in my book because. 
He learns from another minister that someone in his command on the West Coast where he's serving is committing adultery. Now he has made a full confession to his wife but can't stop the affair. So Ellison intercedes with his commander and gets him transferred out of, out of the country. So the, the affair is ended. And that sort of intervention is not that unique. I, I, I found another case of a rabbi He's utterly, uh, he's very upset. This, this woman comes to him uh, 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 in the service. She's, she's in the military. She's been impregnated by a, a, a GI, a Jewish GI. And he wants them to get married, the GI. And the GI is completely against this. And the woman doesn't want to get married. In fact, she starts telling him how, how she's going to get an abortion in Chicago. The end of the story, I don't quite know the full story, but they definitely did not get married. <laughs> but he's very upset with the whole, both they're not getting married and, and with the abortion. So morality issues run, 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 runs through it. Um, um, one of the, the endearing, uh, I think, parts of the story was the degree that chaplains were, in both the Army and Navy training, expected to take care of the, the needs of all religious GIs. And, so one chaplain, Howard Wilson, um, he, he would, uh, I, I, I'll, I'll just briefly read what he was tasked to do in chaplain school. He said, for one, for one of his assignments, he was tasked as the only chaplain on duty with your unit stationed on the post with chaplains of other faiths for him to draw upon and required to, quote, prepare for a weekday and Sunday religious program for November 1942 to meet the religious needs of all your unit. Protestant, Jewish, and Catholic, note holidays. So this meant, um, this kind of training meant like the, as one reformed chaplain once talked about the rabbi for who'd never seen, who'd been in the, in the walls of Flatbush, uh, you know, Flatbush uh, Queens for most of his life, you know, he's counseling, you know, sick Protestant and, and, and Catholic boy. He's required to sort of come up with a schedule for, for Roman Catholic and Protestant services. And by this, you know, rabbi, uh, uh, Reverend Wilson is required to, you know, November, you know, Jewish holidays and Roman Catholic feast days and other holidays. And this, this is, this is really central to both the, the ethos of both chaplain schools and the ethos of chaplaincy. For example, they roomed together men of different faiths, and so you often had a rabbi and a priest and and a, and a minister together. Um, the, another comment of a, a Christian scientist a practitioner who was a chaplain said he, he was really upset. He, he got along very much with his Presbyterian uh, uh, roommate, but he said, I had to disabuse him that we blessed handkerchiefs in, in the Christian science faith. So there was a lot of, it was, it was really, I, 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 some of the comments these GIs write in their diaries or letters, I mean, this one rabbi just really comes to really like his Catholic brethren, the ch chaplains. He says they're regular guys and just, you know, I, I never thought I'd get so close to these Catholic priests in terms of friendships and, 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 and really thinking of them as, 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 fe as fellow colleagues. I want to say something about Wilson, who, who goes through chaplains. Who, he's eventually deployed with the Air, Army Air Force. He's in England. And their roles are often very diverse. So one of the things Wilson does, and a lot of chaplains do when they can, is they do religious pilgrimages or just they're, they're, they're in love with being assigned overseas. I mean, many, many in cases the army or navy makes it possible for them to visit the holy land uh, or the promised land um and they you know they're 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 they're, they're, they're they love the fact they can go to jerusalem for example and walk the stations of for example the stations of the cross uh wilson while he's there takes his men to different churches and different communities he sort of has these sort of his historic tours he also speaking on morality uh, chaplains were designated often by the commander to investigate GIs wanted to marry women, say, in England. So in his files, there there's investigations on whether an English spouse is suitable, is suitable for, for, for marriage. Um, chaplains, I think they're, they're, um, their role most appreciated by GIs. One is a counselor, is a friendly ear to listen to, and, and chaplains are very good, I think, at least all the chaplains I, I encountered are of counseling men from different faiths. Um, and most are trying not to proselytize directly, I think. Um, ironically, Catholic priests are the most sensitive to proselytizing, and they really are fearful that their, their boys will be raided by the Protestant ministers. In turn, and you see this in a lot of Pew's co correspondence, there's a fear of just growing Catholic power. There's a real angst about within Pew's correspondence, and even within some chaplains themselves. So there's a... a, 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 a 
Presbyterian chaplain, uh, Renwick Kennedy, assigned to a, um, a medical unit, a frontline medical unit. And he, he's really upset with a lot of the boozing of the doctors um, and a lot of their double standards. You know, the enlisted men are, are, are prohibited from certain things. They are not, they, they take advantage of their officer status. But he also, th he, he thinks a lot of the ministers, he thinks that the churches, the Protestant churches do not send their best men to the fold. And he, he's, very, he's, he's, very, he's very critical. Um, what I also am struck by, there, there are a lot of Protestant leaders are upset with the, with the number of Catholics in the, in, the, in the senior ranks of the chaplaincy. The chief of chaplain is a Monsignor, but several of the his subordinates are also Catholic. Although there is a prominent Protestant, uh, Protestant minister uh, who is in the ch high up in the chap chaplaincy, as, along with a rabbi. So I think, I think the fear of Catholic power, power was, was greatly upset. And there's a sort of ironic twist. A true, um, there are huge numbers of, of priests who serve, but they never quite meet their, never quite meet their quota. But I, I, I one of the things that's, that besides counseling GIs is uh, counsel, really meeting the needs of GIs going in, in battle and the aftermath of battle. So you have a chaplain like Ben Rose, who very much a, a Presbyterian minister, who's very much upfront with the men, you know, preaches to them before, before the Normandy invasion. In looking at Rose, um, I think one of the things Rose will disabuse you, if you look closely at Chaplin's papers, I tried to find, you know, my struggle with trying to find GIs talking about religion, but chaplains do talk about religion, this is their job. And so they're gonna, you know, Rose was very skeptical of battlefield con uh, con conversions. He, he, he thinks they don't last very long. And I think that's substantiated. And also, I think one of the myths we have about World War II, but all wars, is that there are no atheists in foxholes. And boy, were there, you get some chaplain's accounts, boy, are there atheists in foxholes. I remember one, one minister said, chaplain said, all these guys in Okinawa wanted was a, a cigarette and to be written up for medals. And one Catholic priest is so annoyed and so so disturbed. He says, one, one, um, one Catholic, uh, a, you know, Catholic was so upset with his priest back home, he didn't want to talk to me. Um, there, there is, um, you know, there are atheists in foxholes, and and in, and one 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 Marine, he's at a conference at Harvard on religion. He even says, "Yes, there are very devout GIs, uh, you know, no doubt, but there are also lots of atheists and agnostics." And he said, "Some of the bravest men I I knew in battle were agnostics and atheists." And so, you know, faith does sustain people, but there are others were sustained in, 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 other, in other ways. Um, well, another role besides sustaining men in battle and, 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 and GIs, while the Protestant leaders and particularly uh, Catholic leaders are very, um, and Orthodox leaders are very concerned about men departing from Orthodoxy, um, you know, Catholics going to Protestant services or, or Protestants be lured to the, you know, Catholic services. Um, there, there, there is, GIs are often incredibly ecumenical. And so it was not uncommon for Jews, but also Protestants who have very different views of the sacrament to take mass from a Catholic priest, to take, to take communion from a Catholic priest. Uh, one rabbi says, you know, he finds himself the only clergy on this troop ship ready for an invasion. And he, he knows he can't lead mass, but he had, you know, he, has one of the Catholic boys say the rosary and he, he, they read from Catholic scripture and they, and they sing Catholic hymns. Then he leads the Protestant service and a lot of reform rabbis are, are fine leading the standard Protestant service. Um, and then he says, I led the Jewish service. And he said, what was striking is men stayed off. Many of the men on the troop ship said, stayed for all three, three services. So GIs were, were seeking comfort uh, and could be very ecumenical uh, and very unorthodox on how they were seeing comf seeking comfort. One Episcopal priest says he he was kind of stunned how many Protestants from denominations that don't really at, emphasize the sacrament, like Baptists, want communion. And he said, I should have been more prepared like my fellow chaplain who's a priest. He said, my Catholic priest, the Catholic chaplain with me in, in the Fox Hall in Iwo Jima, he had reserve communion. To reserve, uh, and so he was able to give the sacrament throughout the battle. He said, "Next time I go into battle, I'll be more. I'll be more prepared." Uh, Chaplain Elson, who I mentioned briefly, he's the you know he he transfers a, uh, gets a he gets an officer transferred overseas to stop an adulterous affair. 
Uh, he talks very movingly about um, presiding over funerals in sort of in, in, in the gray days of December. Um, he, he, along with, with some of the, with, with, the, with some quartermaster a corp, uh, a great registration uh, members, but also a lot of prisoners of war, German POWs, presiding over funerals. And he's essentially, the congregation is some quartermasters and some POWs, but he ensures that 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 a few, you know, that that that, that the departed are are memorialized and, and are are remembered. And I think th this is really important to GIs. That that, um, and I think chaplains have that great opportunity when they lead lead services to really explain faith uh, and the, and the tenets of faith, but also to talk about the principles why we're fighting that 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 this 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 is not in vain. I, on the theme, and as I said, I'm keeping I, because I, I want to. I want to keep plenty of time for questions. So I remember I gave this talk once, and they someone asked the question, "What about women and African Americans?" And I said, "Oh, I have a whole chapter on that. What would you like to know? What would you like to know about uh, women?" And uh, um, as I said, I, I think um, one of the questions that a story, you know, I, I've been puzzled at when I first started the book, or or question became clear. In terms of how historians have written about religion, is in the 1920s. You, it's the era of the Ku Klux Klan, and really nativism ascend, ascended. You have Father Coughlin in the 30s spewing out anti-Semitism, and then you get the 1950s. Will Herberg talks about the American way of, 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 of uh, the American way of religion, where you have really Protestant, Catholic, and Jew, the tri-faith, and, 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 and religious pluralism and tolerance. How did we get there? And a lot of that is World War II. And I think um, one of the things that comes to fro is chaplains uh, uh, really embracing religious pluralism. And there's a remarkable Catholic chap, uh, a Presbyterian chaplain um, that I wanna, I wanna read this paragraph from my book, which, uh, which it's really a credit to Presbyterianism um, and, and, and to chaplaincy. Other voices also condemned uh, anti-Semitism. In, a letter, in his letter to his home congregation, Navy chaplain Jacob, Rabbi Jacob Shackman described the actions of fellow chaplain, a Southern Presbyterian minister we had first met in chaplain school at the College of William and Mary. Bob Stamper impressed Shackman because he possessed an endearing personality mixed with, quote, a passion for fair play and justice. And without providing details, Shankman even characterized him as, as the Negro friend. Shankman provided several specific incidents examples of, of Stamper and confrontation with big, bigotry. In one instance, Shagman described how his colleague Lambanks had, quote, a Christian lady over the telephone for discriminating against a potential Jewish tenant. To the rabbi's surprise, he even declared, what you do hurts me. This is Shagman. My ancestry was Jewish. At first, Shagman was incredulous about the statement from an individual who embodied traditions of, quote, Virginia, Georgia, and Alabama. But when he queried Stamper, uh, when he queried, Stamper explained to Shankman that, quote, if the God, good Lord should choose a Jew, Jesus, through whom to reveal himself, certainly is no lie for me to appropriate Jewish ancestry for myself. This moral courage was also exercised on other occasions, such as when Stamper ordered a naval officer making slurring remarks about the Jews to get out of his car while he was driving. In the presence of an admiral attending one of his services, Stanford called attention to, quote, anti-Semitic anti propaganda, end quote, typed on naval stationery and circulating on his base. In his sermon, he declared, I held up that paper to the light and I saw the watermark of the American eagle. Small people may stoop to, to, to mean and vicious prejudice, but they will never blot out or obscure the symbol of American democracy. And so there are this sort of interfaith understanding many in fact realized and, and spoke out about the need for tolerance and denounced bigotry and, and, and anti-Semitism anti, anti and, and racism. Uh, since I'm only, I, I wanna leave plenty of time for questions, I, I wanna say a few things about the sort of post-war legacy of the war. Um, um, uh, this is something I would have, uh, there are a number of books I would have, you know, that, that I'd love to get people to write on and dissertations to do. For example, I feel I only scratch the surface on the, on the chaplaincy. Um, one of my big regrets is at one point, all the army chaplains records were in DC. And I said, 
my, my, my research trip, I said, I'll come back and use these another time. Uh, even though I knew they were going to be transferred out to St. Louis, but I thought, oh, the ways of bureaucracy, that's going to be decades from now. And then they were transferred out to St. Louis and it's impossible to get a seat. But I'd love to know more about these several hundred black chaplains. I mean, I, I talked a little bit about it. And the Army has this great record and the Navy not so good um, on, on race. Um, the Navy only appointed two black chaplains during the, during the whole war, uh, which, which is unfortunate. Uh, you know, I, I keep encountering, uh, you know, I look things up where I just in, in strange ways encounter, for example, the editor of a major, uh, you know, a major post-war Bible, I, I find out is in fact a, a, a um, uh, is in fact an Army chaplain. Uh, I learned, I'm giving a talk this week on Rabbi Eichhorn, who's the founding, uh, uh, founding rabbi of the synagogue and, and also the first Hillel rabbi. And I found that a successor at Temple Israel in, in Tallahassee was also a liberator. Uh, rabbi Eichhorn was a liberator of Dachau and, and, Ra and Rabbi Lorge was a liberator of Buchenwald. And I thought, you know, two, two chaplains from the same town. And I'd be curious to know, you know, you're a more recent, con your, your congregation has merged from two, but I wonder from, the, you know, previous congregation, you know, the congregation you merged from, did you have any chaplains that, you know, any of the ministers that ministered to you, had they been, had they been chaplains? So there, there's quite a, quite a story to be told, I think, and I, I feel I only scratched the surface. And I felt they, I wanted to write more about, about Reverend El Edward Elson, because after the war, he gets one of the most important pulpits, I think, within the Presbyterian Church. He becomes pastor of the National Presbyterian Church from 1947 to 1973. And he is, he is the, 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 the pastor that, that baptizes Dwight Eisenhower, and Eisenhower is his member of his congregation. And he has quite a correspondence with Eisenhower. And he's, he also finds it a little awkward, at least Stephen wants to come to his church, because he knows, personally, he's for Ike, but he knows as a pastor, he needs to minister all, but he's clearly, you know, he, he's even giving Ike a campaign advice in 1956. Um, and he is, he is also, he does save some embarrassing cor correspondence. Twice he's taken in by confidence people when, as a pastor. And in one case, it was really, had, a, had very bad circumstances, awful circumstances. He becomes chaplain of the, of the, of the, of the uh, Senate. Um, before retiring, and he, for example, presides over um, Justice o William O. Douglas's funeral, and and uh, and talks and talks about the musical selections. Um, uh, Ellison, you know, this sort of post-war, uh, you know, and I think I'll end my talk here. This post-war legacy of this, of this sort of interfaith understanding, both among GIs but also among chaplains, is I think reflected by Ellison because Ellison at one point. Uh, the last sort of last cons significant concern within many Protestant circles over Catholic power comes to fore in the late 40s and early 50s, but it, it, but it pretty quickly dissipates. And when, when Ellison, um, when, 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 it, when his fellow chaplain, a Roman Catholic priest who's now in Buffalo, learns that Ellison is going to be Ike's pastor, he, this, this priest writes to Ellison and says, well, I, it's great to know someone famous, you know, I really, you know, he, and then he says to him, and I think this is revealing pre-Vatican too, he says, with, with Ike is your, with, you're going to be Ike's spiritual advisor, I know he, Ike will not go wrong, that you'll provide the right guidance, and I think, you know, for a Catholic priest to say, you know, pre-Vatican too, that a Presbyterian minister will steer Ike on the, on the, on the, on the high road really says a lot about this sort of understanding and mutual respect between faiths. So I, I could talk for, yeah, as I said, for, for hours on different themes, but I wanted to, I wanted to leave, I know you, you have church soon to attend and I want to leave plenty of questions, uh, plenty of time for questions. Thank you so much. If the book is as interesting as the little synopsis that we've just had for the past 30 minutes, there's a ton of stuff in there to read and enjoy and and, and to, to mull over. Um, I, I've got a whole bunch of questions, but I, I don't want to monopolize things. So let me start with one. Um, you, a number of times you started a sentence with a priest and a rabbi and a minister. And I was waiting for the joke to follow. Yeah, yes. <laughs> was there 
um, a, uh, a significant amount of humor about the role of chaplains. Um, I didn't. I didn't find too much. I mean, that's I think what's not been written down. But I'm sure there was. I will say this one rabbi is just so funny because he says he's clearly delighted with these. I mean, he says at one point he makes sort of a joke to his wife because this one when they stand formation. There's this one, and I should have put it in the book. It was one of the things I discovered later. He essentially rests in the, you know, you stand in this formation, you almost rest in the hand of another guy. And he says, I never thought I'd ever be this close to a Catholic priest, you know, and so dependent on him. Because apparently in this formation, you know, he described and he said, you know, you really are dependent on the other guy. You were dependent on each other to do this properly. Uh, so I think there, I think there was, there was some good humor and, and good banter and, uh, and, 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 and really, um, and some really good jokes and also some interesting, uh, you know, I think this one, 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 he was a, he was a chaplain during the Korean war, but I, he was starting to laugh. He said, it was sort of interesting. We got to chaplain schools, at least from his perspective is we realized we had a really a lot in common with the rabbis because they had families and we had families. He said, those Catholic priests, boy, did they swear up a storm because they were not used to the women around them. So they, they like, like, you know, he almost gave the impression every, every fourth word was an obscenity and they just were kind of stunned by that because they couldn't get away with that at home, you know. Um, Kathy, you just posted an interesting question on the chat that I, that I I think Dr. Peeler, began to address but didn't uh, uh yes a uh, women challenge they said uh so this is one of the questions and i always think i'm i i think would would make a good good friday service the problem of establishment of religion and what it does to religion you know is even though i'm very i really embrace the Rooseveltian view of 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 you know, particularly in the case of, the, you know, why the government should support the chaplaincy in religious life, because GIs do not have freedom. If you're in, in New Guinea, you can't go to your local church or synagogue. That's just going to be impossible. You're not going to find really priests and rabbis and ministers out, in the, out, out on the front line of the Iwo Jima. But it's problematic when government establishes religion, even in, a, in, even in a benevolent way and even in a positive way, and even when it's trying to respect religious pluralism. And so one of the cases it doesn't respect religious pluralism, there are denominations in the 1940s that ordain ministers. And so some of these ministers write to the army chief of chaplains and, and they say, we want to serve. And, and they even say, not, they, they even write, we want to serve wax. We should be the, the minister for the wax. And, and William Arnold says, absolutely not, as does, as does workmen. And so women don't join the chaplaincy until until the late until the 1970s or not early 19s in, in terms of the early 19s in terms of the, in terms of the early 1970s it's interesting also when i said that as much as like william arnold he's a bit misogynistic at one point he thinks women can't even be chaplains assistants um he says he thinks it'll make gis uncomfortable if they're in the office and whereas workmen in the Navy are much more open to women, to women chaplain assistants, and the Navy is much more aggressive in recruiting uh, women for that billet to serve in the States. Amy? Um, it's interesting about, I, I, should have, I should have pulled that figures out for you, and I, I'd have to look it up in my book. There were a number of chaplains killed in battle and this might be a good point to take uh, to talk about, say, for the first first rabbi killed in battle. Um, uh, the uh, the most I did not lead with my book on this story, but but the story of the four chaplains. So in 1943, there is in fact a rabbi, a priest, and two Protestant ministers heading overseas, and they're on a troop ship that is torpedoed by by the by by a German U-boat, and these four chaplains give up their life. By life vests and their scarves, and they go down with the ship, and they're seen in the distance praying, and that that was they do not actually get the Medal of Honor; they get a series of other medals in the post-war period, and they become a symbol that not, never has quite caught on. I mean, the four chaplains. And there was uh, there was an aborted effort to make a, a Warner Brothers movie on the four chaplains. Uh, their efforts to create a memorial in. Um, in Philadelphia, ran into all kinds of, of, of issues, um, uh, partly because of protests from the Catholic Church. Um, but they are they are probably the most one of the most dramatic incidents of, of the chaplains sacrificing their lives. 
on, on Pearl Harbor Day, several chaplains lost their life, including this one Catholic priest who, he was safe, he was above deck when the, when the you know, he was in a safe spot when the, when the initial attack came in, but he rushed below and he eventually got trapped and drowned. Um, um, and and that, that was, you know, one of the, tra- you know, one of the great tragic losses of lives. A number of chaplains lost their lives in the Philippines as POWs. So there, there, were, there were definitely chaplains who, who did make the ultimate sacrifice. Anybody else, Michael? Yeah, Kurt, um, <clears throat> I'm I'm sort of fascinated with this post-war legacy issue, uh, as you know, um, and uh, I- I'm kind of uh, I- I'm curious what your view is. You've studied this so intensively, um, but I'm curious. It's my perception that. World War II was essentially the high water mark of uh, America's uh, uh, pluralism uh, and tolerance, uh, and that in a lot of ways, uh, we've basically been on a downhill slide since then. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure a lot of that has to do with the fact that, you know, we're in these information silos where people are only hear one side of a story, whereas in World War II, everybody was, you know, uh, in this together. Um, I'm just curious what your perspective of that is. Yeah, it, it's interesting about, um, it's interesting that point about, uh, so like looking, I'll even let, let me do it, the, like, I keep toying, you know, I'd love to get someone to do the Korean War so, GI story and Vietnam there's one there's one book on the Catholic chaplaincy that I don't on the chaplaincy that I don't think is very good you know it's a book about the chaplaincy there's no Vatican II doesn't appear in the in the in the uh you know in the in the index and I think how can you talk in the 60s without talking about Vatican II if you're talking about Catholic priests and cat and lay Catholics um I think in the army um you know one of the things I think I wish more mainline uh Protestants uh, ministers would serve, more reformed rabbis would serve. Um, I, I did read this remark, like, you know, the stories that would, I would have loved to put her story in because I was reading the obituary, this remarkable, one of the first women rabbis. And she she was a, she was assigned to the paratrooper, so she learned how to jump. And I, I had to respect the moral courage when she lectured uh, uh, Elie Wiesel about the need to say prayers for all the victims of the Holocaust, not just for Jews. And I thought, boy, you are really, you are unabashed. And she died young. And uh, so one of the things you have, I think on the positive side with the chaplaincy, uh, it, it has become even more representative. So you have uh, you have Buddhist you have Buddhist chaplains. There's a half-hearted effort to appoint a Buddhist chaplain for, for Japanese American troops. And there are Japanese American Protestant ministers who serve, but now there are Buddhist ministers. There's even a move to, you know, I think there's now an official atheist chaplain. So the military is actually, I think, very good about expanding the chaplain, but they don't have quotas. They got rid of the quota system, which means, and, and this is not necessarily negative, except it's not balanced, evangelical Protestants. And I think many of them really, there's real tension over, I think there was an acceptance by all major faiths and most of the chaplains, we are, we, we must serve all and we should avoid proselytizing. Thou shalt not poach the other believers, at least while we're in the military. And I think a lot of evangelicals think they must be very, and, and I can I can respect that, you know, you, if you really feel you have the truth, <laughs> it's incumbent on you to convert others. I, can, I understand that tension. Um, but that that um, you know, as I said, I wish the chaplaincy was as representative of diversity. Uh, of, 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 you know, that's one of the needs. Uh, was, was that a question or was that just background noise? <laughs> uh, you, you mentioned um, sure. at one point uh, the, uh, the idea of, of Rep- of, of proportional representation. I listened to a C-SPAN lecture uh, a couple of weeks ago on the role of the church uh, in World War I. And there was a comment that the various denominations were competing to make sure that they were properly and proportionally represented among the chaplaincy. Was there any kind of a competition um, to uh. make sure um, 
the, yeah. the, the dom denominations were represented or was, or was World War II just so big that everybody was throwing everything they had at it? Um, so the military decided um, the chaplaincy was going to be represented, which meant an unprecedented number of rabbis and Catholic priests were appointed chaplains. But also, you were portioned by percentage of the population. The, the government still did religious censuses. And so the, the chaplaincy, there were percentage figures and numbers given for quotas. And so one of the tensions comes from groups that didn't quite some of the smaller denominations don't have enough believers. And so they don't, they're fighting to get some representation. That was one real tension. Um, the other tension is, you know, I think a lot of, a lot of, some Protestant leaders have a lot of misgiving of how many Catholic priests are serving. Though Catholics do not achieve their quota, even, you know, despite this, this huge influx of, of, uh, of chaplains. Um, the other tension, I think, comes from, I mentioned women, but also the government and the Army and Navy differ. It's interesting. The Navy, the Navy likes to make its own officers, and they really like to have Annapolis denominate. So the Navy actually creates the V-12 program, and since they're even willing to pay for the theological education of, mi of ministers, chaplains to be, uh, and they'll take a chaplain right out of seminary. They figure they can train them what they need to do. The Army says, no, you need to have a certain number of years in the pulpit. I think they initially said three years. And both require college degrees and theological degrees. And this, this cuts out three groups of, of, men, of clergy. One, it, it makes it very difficult for Orthodox rabbis to join because they went to European yeshivas in this era. Uh, it makes it very difficult for a lot of African-American ministers to serve because they don't have college or theological degrees. Um, and a lot of evangelicals. Um, you know, I, I knew one of my graduate students uh, at Tennessee was a was had no, it was a, a Methodist minister, but not had gotten gotten to theological school, so he would have been disqualified under those those, those rules. So now there there is competition, but but the competition it's really more the army saying, particularly to a lot of denominations, we need more chaplains. That 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 um, um, many of the major faiths it was a real because these were volunteers to struggle to get enough recruits, enough chaplains willing to say to serve. Hey, uh, Kurt? Yes. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, Rick Arndt, and uh, thank you so much for your presentation this morning. Um, uh, I had a career in the Army, so I was delighted to hear that uh, we kept uh, good records throughout uh, as opposed to the Navy. But uh, I just want to share, as you were talking through this uh, uh, topic, um, in my career, early in my career, I was a uh, uh, a platoon leader of a, a armored cab unit in Vietnam. And we were in field locations where the chaplains would be uh, flown in by helicopter um, uh, every two, maybe th every three weeks. And it just, uh, um, I, I reflect back to that time period when the chaplains came in and uh, our unit, we had about 180 folks in our troop. and. Uh, uh, we probably had about 15 to 20 uh, folks that would gather with the chaplain for a service. And um, I don't know, it, it was just something um, uh, special about that time. There was a pause uh, in uh, the life of uh, the troops and myself and what we were doing uh, there. And so I uh, uh, so thankful to have uh, that uh, chaplain come out and uh, be with the troops for a service. I just wanted to share that. Yeah, that, that I mean, I, I think a lot of GIs really are appreciative of this of this religious accommodation, and uh, you you can um, you know they 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 one of the things I struggle is I, I want people to reflect more about what's going on in their head, and and I know it's going on in their head. They just don't write it down. So I know one 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 guy writes he writes about going to you know services all the time. You know, notes it faithfully in his diary, but he says more about the movies he's watched. Then, then uh, uh, but we know one of the things I think uh, that that there are vagabond chaplains like you experienced. So, for example, Christian Science chaplains and 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 particularly um, Jewish chaplains are more likely to be vagabonds, like basically driving around. In the case of World War II, more often driving around to give services in their jeeps. But there are more chaplains actually assigned to units, and so, like for example, the chaplains with the Nisai regiments. Um, 
this chaplain is like on the front line with these guys. And in fact, he he makes himself the one in charge of getting retrieving the dead. And he'll he'll go out to no man's land to retrieve the war war dead. And um, so I think that that was really comforting to a lot of GIs to have a chaplain, not as this figure who came in just to, you know, every few weeks, every, once or twice a month, but was with them all the time. Um, and so that 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 was harder to sustain in Vietnam. Uh, but thank you for those comments. Yes, that I know you're, you're reflecting what it was clear in the case of World War II. Also, many many GIs really welcomed the, the chaplain and that provision. Any other que any other questions or anything else you'd like? As I said, I I I've, I can talk about a bunch of different topics. <laughs> you you mentioned early on that the chaplains were in the chain of command. Yes. Um, uh, and, and chaplains are one of three or four recognized privileges in the law. You, know, you, you can't make um, uh, a doctor testify about relationship with a patient. You can't make uh, a spouse testify against the, the other half of the marriage. You can't make a minister testify against a, a parishioner. So that that very much goes against current values. But I wonder the extent to which it, it sort of surprised people and whether it caused any reluctance among GIs to say, you know, if I go to my chaplain with my alcohol problem, it's gonna cost me um, something with my commanding officer. Uh, that, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, medical personnel in World War II, at least in the military, did not have, they could be compelled to, to testify against their patients. So that protection didn't exist in World War II. And though, though chaplains were protected, um, to have, you know, those who talked to a chaplain, this, this case comes up as there's this incident, uh, this WAC talks about, about basically one of, her, one of her fellow WACs has a mental breakdown and they're, they're trying to help her. And at one point they bring in the Catholic chaplain to talk to this woman. And, um, and one of the reasons they bring in this chaplain, he was the one person who could not tell on them and could you know, hopefully ideally only help. Uh, and so, yeah, that, 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 I think a lot of GIs really appreciated the fact that chaplains were the one person they could go to for counseling that, that were, were protected. Chaplains also are, are, you know, one of the other things about the status of chaplain is they're unarmed. So, so some chaplains want to carry firearms and they're, they're, they're lectured pretty sternly that they're not supposed to be, you know, ca carry, Carry weapons or or participate uh, participate um, in battle. Um, the other thing about chaplains um, that are very unique in the military chain of command, both for the Army and Navy, and I think really significant for the Navy, is they're the one officer who can freely fraternize with enlisted personnel and still fraternize with the officers. So this one Navy chaplain, this Lutheran pastor, he said he just loved being a chaplain in the sense that. I, you know, he was an officer, so he most most of his meals he lives with the officers. He's got the privilege of the officers, but he said I made it a point to at least at least eat one meal a day with the enlisted personnel, often with the chiefs, um, and he could talk to you know he could freely fraternize with an enlisted man, which which officers are not supposed to do, and I think the Navy really frowned on that. I the Navy. Um, the hierarchy of the Navy. I always remember this one oral history that gives, says a lot about the Navy. He says, it was the end of the war and I had a friend of mine, you know, he, he was supervising some men painting on the deck of this aircraft carrier. And, you know, how much supervising you do on the deck of an aircraft carrier of these men painting. And he was so bored out of his mind. He started painting. He started out, he just picked up a brush and started painting. And he got chewed out by his, his commander for, you know, basically fraternizing with the enlisted men. And officers don't do this. And, and I thought it said, it spoke volumes. So that that's, I think really, that, that sort of privilege to enlist, you know, to, they're one of the few people that can navigate both sides uh, mm -hmm. of the divide in the military. A necessary divide, but still at times, you know, a hard one for people, to, you know, officers enlisted to penetrate. Any other questions here? Michael. I uh, I just I just wanted us to I know we're about to leave. I just wanted to be sure and 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 let Kurt know how much we appreciated him uh, speaking today. It was uh, it was fascinating to have you, especially on Veterans Day. Thank you yeah, so I mean, much I, for this, Kurt. 
Yeah, yeah. I, I have to say, I, I, I've never served in the military, but I, I've gotten to know, A, I interviewed over 200 World War II yeah. veterans, and I, and I always will be indebted to particularly the Rutgers class of 42, because they saved my career by making me <laughs> director of this oral history project. But also of both current active duty and recent veterans. I, I, I for example, have had uh, four Air Force officers have, have gotten PhDs under my direction, and a number of Army officers have gotten masters, and one just is just almost completely finished his PhD. And I really think I, I, I think the highest, particularly of our our, our active of our, our current active duty force, particularly our officers, they're, they're, all the officers I've had as as graduate students, I would want to if I were an enlisted man, I would want to serve under. And they're just they're just incredibly also modest of what they did, you know. In terms of just, I, I just remember. Uh, I had my my first woman PhD as an officer. I just I didn't realize what she had done until her promotion ceremony. Like she had done 50 intelligence flights over Afghanistan. She talked rather matter of factly being caught in the latrine in this base in Iraq when incoming came. And I just thought you guys are just much too modest, and we're really lucky to have you. So so I'll, I'll leave that thought for Veterans Day. Um, I never say to my vets, thank you for your service, but I do try to take them to a lot of free meals during their tenure. <laughs> <laughs> In appreciation. So. Thank you. Well, again. Thank you very much for this great. I, I really love talking to groups uh, like yours and this is such a great faith based recap. group. Yeah, what you just closed us with is a great reminder of, of the sacrifice. You know, not a lot of us have the experience of getting stuck in a cave under fire. Uh, and 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 that is that's not a unique story in, in the military. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. No, I, I've really the story, the the things you know, and you often have to pry it out of particularly professionals. But boy, they do remarkable things for us. Yeah, Louise, can I ask you to talk a bit about your post on the chat? As Louise left, okay. What Louise put up was a link to the survey that the Adult Education Committee put out, um, soliciting ideas from the congregation. We love ideas from the congregation. It's, it's one of the best sources that we have for uh, ideas about programs. And some of the best programs we've had have come from you. So. If you've got an idea, however harebrained you may think it is, it might be something that, that strikes a chord with us and we can pursue. If you've got an idea of who a speaker might be or a topic uh, that you'd like, like to see us pursue, um, what we try to do is, is uh, uh, in significant part the role of a chaplain. We like to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. And we've made it our, our unofficial mission statement here uh, is to make the, the congregation uncomfortable for an hour a week on uh, Sunday morning. So if you've got an idea, please do let us know. Next week's speaker, I promise you, will make us feel uncomfortable. It's a bit different in that first, there is a strong preference for people to attend in person. So if you can, please attend in person. It's Interfaith Sunday, and it's a speaker that has been brought to us by the Intercongregational Partnership Committee, uh, made up of us and BJC and the, the Muslim community. And uh, it will be Sister Charlotte Ann Wagner, uh, who is a Catholic nun and an immigration attorney. And she'll be talking about the refugee crisis here in Washington, right here, right now. And it will be in, um, in uh, Covenant Hall. We expect a large crowd from all three congregations. And um, we will, of course, be Zooming it. It will be a different Zoom link. So if you, want to, if you have to attend by Zoom, um, click only on the links that come out in this week's uh, bullets. Uh, she's got a, a fantastic reputation. She is on the ground working with these unannounced busloads of immigrations who are being sent up from Texas and Arizona and Florida 
to the Greyhound Terminal in downtown Washington. Uh, uh, just people randomly put onto a bus without regard to family composition, where they may have relatives who can, can help get them stabilized in the US. It's a hugely challenging problem um, beyond the political theater that's involved. So next Sunday morning, same time in Covenant Hall, or if you have to, if you're in Kentucky or Florida, we'll be live on Zoom too. And we'll have, uh, we'll have the, the link posted. So thank you all. And I hope to see you all in church to celebrate our veterans in, um, at 1030. See you next week. Thank you very much. Real, a real pleasure. Thank you, Thanks, Kurt. Thanks, Dr. Peeler. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.